within the advanced capitalist countries, there is a shift towards fascism in order to deal with the kind of political challenges that capitalism is currently facing that Professor Harilal referred to. And I think this is an extremely dangerous situation, particularly made dangerous by the fact that in a country like France, since the end of the Vichy regime, before the second, I mean, you know, before Hitler actually marched into France, you have never had a far-right government, a fascist government, which you, everybody is expecting would be in place on 7th of July, led by Marine Le Pen's party. And at the same time, there are many other countries which are going fascist, particularly in Europe and, of course, elsewhere, even in the third world, in our own country. So the dangerous shift towards fascism is something which really uh, is a cause for extreme concern. I'd like to devote a little bit of time to it before I discuss other issues and particularly the challenges uh, which this, this poses before the democratic forces of the world. That basically I believe that while liberal opinion does not see the emergence of fascism in non-political terms. They see it essentially as a group of people who, 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 who hijack democracy and so on, that it's essentially political. In our own country, the talk is about, you know, um, Rath Yatra and this and that, promoting the kind of uh, fascist growth that took place here. I believe there is a very deep economic reason behind the emergence of fascism all over the world. And that what we see today, the global emergence of fascism is in fact the, 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 the limit point of the hegemony of global finance capital. In other words, the denouma of the hegemony of global finance capital is the emergence of global fascism. Why do I say this? I say this for two very obvious reasons, and, and they're interconnected. The first is that global finance capital has actually emerged at a time when you have nation states at a political level, when you have the working class movements in virtually every country they arrange on political, within nation states, the political arrangement, the trade union arrangement, they're all confined to the nation state. You don't have an international working class movement that gives calls for international strikes. You don't certainly have an international peasant movement. So you have a situation where Capital is globalized, but the classes that capital confronts are not globalized. They are still arranged at national level. Now, this has a number of implications. For instance, one very obvious implication is that in the United States, the trade union movement is so greatly weakened that according to a calculation made by Joseph Stiglitz, the real wage of an average male American worker in 2011 was marginally lower than in 1968. And this is something which, 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 which I can confirm because I recently met Joseph Stiglitz and I asked him, do you stick to that conclusion? He said, absolutely. So, so the point is that, you know, in the United States, and, and why is that the case? That's obviously the case because capital is mobile. If the American workers in any factory decide to go on a strike, then the capitalist would in fact move his plant to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to, 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 to India, to wherever. So that is used. I mean, that's, that's a very special case of what Marx had written about, namely centralization of capital is something which is invariably acts to weaken the trade union movement. Trade unions are organized within a factory. 
if you have centralization of capital where one capitalist own 10 factories, then unless the trade unions within the 10 factories have a coordinated arrangement between them, then of course you'd have a situation where the capitalist in any particular fact, the, 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 the capitalist would be able to confront strike action in any particular factory. So the globalization of capital, which is an expression of centralization of capital is one which actually has hit the trade union movement hard, even in the advanced capitalist countries. Now, if that is the case, then you may think that because of this, there should be a strengthening correspondingly of the trade union movement here because, because if capital is shifting to the third world countries, then of course industrial rate, a rate of industrialization goes up, the labor reserves get used up, therefore the tightness in the labor market and therefore the trade unions here should be becoming stronger. As a matter of fact, that is not the case. In fact, once I had gone to a, a, a meeting in Barcelona where there were some Spanish trade unions, they had invited me, and I talked about unemployment in India. They were absolutely flabbergasted. They said, you have unemployment in India? We thought we have unemployment because of the fact that our capital is shifting to India. So if you also have unemployment, how do you explain this? So the point is that Despite the shift of capital from the global north to the global south, the enormous reserve armies of labor that you find in the global south do not get exhausted. On the contrary, they actually get replenished. That is a proportion of what you may call labor reserves to the total uh, workforce is something that actually rises, if anything, and that's before the crisis has begun. In other words, this is something which you find secularly in the period of neoliberalism, which is the period of hegemony of international finance capital, because neoliberalism is the policy that is pushed and advocated by international finance capital. Now, why is that the case? That's obviously the case because under a neoliberal regime, because there's competition between countries in selling goods, you actually find that there is a far more accelerated rate of technological innovation, which raises the rate of growth of labor productivity. If you don't raise the rate of growth of labor productivity, in that case, your markets would be snatched away by the East Asian countries and so on. So there's a competitive struggle between the different countries to increase the rates of growth of labor productivity and to raise the technological, the rate of technological progress. This. Now, this is something which is quite often considered to be a very good thing. You, f you find politicians saying, oh, you know, it's wonderful that we're having uh, such technological progress, high rates of growth of labor productivity and so on. But on the other hand, what this means also is that employment does not increase correspondingly, that the rate of growth of employment is just the difference between the rate of growth of output and the rate of growth of labor productivity. So even if you have high rates of GDP growth, like in India, it is claimed we have high rates of GDP growth, though many people like Arvind Subramanian, Subramanian have been arguing that that's exaggerated, that the actual rate of uh, GDP growth in the recent period has not been anything more than 4.5%. But let's accept the government statistics that show that an accelerated rate of GDP growth has taken place. But if you find a high rate of labor productivity growth, then that is something which actually would tend to work against the increase in employment. This, by the way, is also true of China. What is considered the elasticity of employment with respect to output. That means if you have a 1% increase in output, how much is the percentage increase in employment is remarkably low. In China, is estimated to be 0 0.08. That means that you really, if you have 1% increase in output, you have 0.08% increase in employment. So virtually, virtually, despite 
manufacturing output growing very rapidly in China, service sector output growing very rapidly in India, you actually do not find employment growth anywhere to a corresponding extent. And what is more, in India certainly, and in many third world countries, most third world countries, employment growth falls below the rate of growth of population, the rate of growth of the workforce, which basically means that the labor reserves increase. Now, I'm not saying that there may not be individual countries, individual small countries to which a lot of capital comes and therefore you actually find that they use up their labor reserves and so on. But this is something which is not a general phenomenon for the global south. Now, if this is the case, then you find that in the global south, wages continue to remain stuck at a more or less subsistence level. And in the global north now, wages do not rise either because of the globalization of capital. As a result, the average level of wages in the world really do not rise in, 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 to any significant extent. what In fact, if you look at statistics, the country where you have had very notable increases in wages is China, where the increase in wages has been an administered increase because of the government decreeing an increase in wages. If real wages don't increase, but you have labor productivity rising, then of course you have the share of surplus rising in world output. And a rise in the share of surplus occurs not just at the world level, it occurs even at the level of individual countries. Therefore, if you take the world as a whole, there is effectively during the period of globalization, which is the period of hegemony of globalized finance capital, there has been a shift from wages to surplus. Now, there's nothing new about this. I'm simply providing an explanation for it, which is different, though the matter itself has been noticed, above all, by Thomas Piketty and his team, because they, they, they talk about an enormous increase that has taken place in inequality. But the implication of this is, of course, that this gives rise to what economists would call an ex-ante overproduction crisis. That means not necessarily an actual overproduction crisis, but it is a tendency towards overproduction because the propensity to consume uh, out of wages is much higher than the propensity to consume out of surplus. Therefore, if you shift from wages to surplus, then there is a tendency towards overproduction. This tendency may be kept in check by one, John Maynard Keynes thought that this tendency should be kept in check through state intervention. As a matter of fact, this tendency has been kept in check uh, in the current world conjuncture because of the asset price bubbles in the United States. In the 90s, there was the uh, dot-com bubble. And subsequently, when the dot-com bubble collapsed, Alan Greenspan, who was then the chairman of the Fed, Federal Reserve Board in the United States, lowered interest rates and, of course, generated a housing bubble. But with the collapse of the housing bubble, no similar bubble has taken place. John Maynard Keynes uh, said, thought that state intervention could, in fact, provide that kind of, you know, I mean, could, could, could counter the ex-ante tendency to overproduction, to prevent the ex-ante tendency uh, from becoming an exposed tendency, from, from getting realized. Uh, in fact, as you know, John Maynard Keynes was extremely worried I mean, he was writing in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution, extremely worried that unless this is done to the working class, if the levels of unemployment which the Great Depression saw continued, in that case, the working class would actually take the Bolshevik solution. Therefore, to preserve capitalism, he found it absolutely essential that the capitalist country should bring down their rate of unemployment, and this he thought, and you should, should reach full employment, according to him, uh, which actually he thought could be done through state intervention. But state intervention in a period of uh, hegemony of 
globalized finance is really out of the question. For reasons I don't have to go into, and, and you know, globalized fina finance is opposed to fiscal deficits, invariably opposed to fiscal deficits. During the gold standard years, the fiscal deficit that each country maintained was supposed to be 0% of GDP. Nowadays, the fiscal deficit that most countries maintain is allowed to be 3% of GDP. In our country, 3% center, 3% states. But basically, if you look at the European Union, 3% of GDP is a fiscal deficit you're allowed to maintain. Why finance is opposed to fiscal deficit is a very deep question on which I don't want to go in, in, into in this lecture. Uh, but the point is anyway, most countries now have fiscal responsibility, responsibility legislation, which is symptomatic again of the hegemony of finance. We don't have legislations that say a minimum 3% should be spent on health of GDP. We don't have legislations that say a minimum 6% should be spent on education as a proportion of GDP. But we do have laws that say that a certain percentage should, more than a certain percentage, should not be spent uh, as fiscal deficit. Why is that? That is actually the hegemony of globalized finance. Now, if fiscal deficit is therefore limited. You cannot just raise the fiscal deficit and finance larger government expenditure by raising the fiscal deficit. At the same time, taxing the capitalists and taxing the rich is also out of the question because of the fact that that is something that finance capital automatically would oppose because that pinches them. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you would know that during the Biden administration, Janet Yellen, who is the current Treasury Secretary, proposed that there should be a minimum corporate tax rates that countries should agree on. And they suggested 25%. No country agreed, although, you know, most countries did not agree to it, and therefore they, they only settled on a 15% tax rate, which is below the existing tax rates anyway in most countries, existing corporate tax rates. So, so the point is that taxing the rich, taxing the capitalists, is of course out of the question again because of the hegemony of globalized finance capital. That really leaves the only option of raising government expenditures uh, is, would be through taxing the working people, workers in the advanced countries, workers and peasants in countries like ours. But the point is that if you tax them then that doesn't, and, and spend that proceeds, then it doesn't add to demand. If you, if you, if the government spends 100 rupees and raises the 100 rupees in the form of taxes from working people who more or less spend all what they earn, then you find that there is very little net addition of demand. Therefore, the ability of governments to intervene in the manner that John Maynard Keynes had visualized is something which is really out under the current conjuncture. Therefore, we have this situation of crisis, which is there in the world economy. As a matter of fact, if you look at the decade before, the decade before the onset of COVID-19 was the decade with the lowest growth rate since the second, um, lowest decadal growth rate since the Second World War. And if you look at the European Union in particular, you find that the European Union has remained virtually stagnant in terms of per capita real income during this entire period from 2010 onwards. So, given this, therefore, there is a very serious crisis. Now, this crisis is something we, we also see the consequences of this crisis, which manifests itself not just in terms of stagnation, but also in terms of unemployment over and above the unemployment that I was talking about during the heyday of neoliberalism. I was saying under the neoliberal regime, the rate of growth of employment falls short of the rate of growth of the labor force. As a matter of fact, in a period of crisis, the rate of growth of unemployment, uh, 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 rate of growth of employment falls even shorter 
of the rate of growth of the labor force. That's why we have the unemployment crisis in our country and also elsewhere, including in the European Union. Periods of unemployment are really periods that are conducive to the growth of fascism. And that's because of the fact that these are periods in which you have monopoly capitalists getting worried about a challenge to their hegemony that would arise because of unemployment, exactly what Keynes had anticipated. And they try to meet this challenge by forming an alliance with new fascist elements, with fascist elements, which always exist in any modern society. So the point is that, that fascist elements exist. Jean-Marie Le Pen's political party, National Front, existed in France for decades. But the point is that this is a period in which monopoly capital enters into an alliance with the fascist elements. And in fact, in France, it's very clear because the media, the biggest media baron in France, who is called the Rupert Murdoch of France, is the one who's actually not only financing Marine Le Pen's party, but what is more, is making sure that Marine Le Pen's party gathers around itself all the conservative forces, some of the Gaullist elements in France in order to really capture power. So this is something which you find everywhere. This you find in our country as well. Now the question is, why why, why finance capital or globalized finance and its local offshoots enter into such an alliance is something which is not difficult to fathom because this is something which, first of all, divides the working class because the main symptom of fascism is to other a hapless minority and therefore, you divide the working class in terms of Muslim, anti-Muslim. You divide in terms of immigrants, non-immigrants, in terms of blacks, non-blacks, and so on, so that you actually are other a small, hapless minority and generate hatred against that minority. That's the primary symptom of fascism. That changes the discourse the intellectual discourse in the country, that also has the effect of dividing the, the working people, dividing the challenge that actually could be launched against the hegemony of capital. So it's not, and, and of course, it is authoritarianism, which suppresses the trade unions and so on politically. Uh, and it is something which is invariably, therefore, associated also with the generation of a personality cult. In different countries, this generation of a personality cult has reached different levels, but nonetheless, this is one of the features of fascism. So, so the fact that fascism comes as useful for monopoly capital, particularly in a period of crisis, is not something which is very surprising. But the question is, why doesn't the working class put up a fight against this emergence of fascism? I think that's a very important issue. The German philosopher Walter Benjamin had analyzed the development of Hitler, I mean, the, the, the rise to power of Hitler, as coming on the backs of failed revolutions. In Germany, you remember, in 1918, there was a revolution which took the lives of Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. Then, in 1920s, there, there were several attempts at revolutions in Germany. And so his argument was that fascism rose on the backs of failed revolutions because the working class had got exhausted by uh, these failed revolutions and therefore Hitler could come to power. Now, of course, we have had no failed revolutions and what is more, in the post-war period, there have not been any failed revolutions. But the enfeeblement of the working class 
is something which has been made possible because, again, of the neoliberal policies which have been pushed down the throats of most countries uh, because of the hegemony of in globalized finance capital. Enfeeblement of trade union movements because you have globalized capital confronting nationally organized workers is something I've already talked to. The fact that there is a rise in the labor reserves is something uh, relative size of the labor reserves I've already talked to. But there are many other features of neoliberalism that actually weaken the working class. One very important feature is the privatization of public sector assets. The working class is much better organized in public sector enterprises than it is in private sector enterprises. According to one American figure I have seen, about 33% of uh, public sector workers, and that includes the education sector, uh, are unionized, while in the private sector it's only about 7% which is unionized. One of the reasons why in France you have a very powerful trade union movement still surviving is because quite a significant sector of the French economy still continues to be under public ownership. Now, if that is the case, then of course privatization is something which would necessarily lead to a weakening of the trade union movement. And this is something that we actually do find. So, the hegemony of finance capital, globalized finance capital, really ushers in fascism, or if you like, leads to a denouement, which is globalized fascism, in two very obvious ways. One, that it leads the country, it leads the world economy and individual countries to a structural crisis from which they cannot escape, not a cyclical crisis, not a periodic crisis, but in fact, a structural crisis from which they cannot escape. And secondly, it also weakens the working class because of which it becomes both necessary and possible to have the emergence of fascism, because the working class resistance or the working people's resistance is something which is thereby enfeebled. And this is something which we have been finding. Against this, what can be done? Because I think this is something which, which, is, which is now uh, taking, you know, is, is really priority in terms of Europe. And of course, even in the case of the United States, is very likely that Donald Trump is going to come to power.